Hmm. Welcome back to Indie Wash uh, Anime Review Part 18. This time I'm viewing the third film release of the series, Swords of an Honorable Ruler. Yep, released in 2003 in Japan, released here in 2006. You're probably asking, why it take three years to release a film here? That's Viz Media. They have a tendency to do that a lot. They take a freaking long time to release them over here. Yeah, it's nothing unusual for them. Like, for example, when they released a dub for Naruto, the first two episodes came out three years after the series already frickin' started in Japan. That's not a joke. That seriously did happen. Anyways, for this particular film, starts off 200 years before the events of the main story in the past, where you see a young Shishimaru and his father, who is also Inuyasha's father, the great dog demon general. Where he basically has a conversation with Shishimaru on the beach. Basically, it's talking about he's very blood. The basically typical Shishimaru stuff where he doesn't have to protect. He really wants the Tensaga so badly. Tensaga. And he just goes off and apparently he transforms into his beast in his, uh, in his demon form. And apparently he's still recovering from the wounds suffered from Rokosai. Yeah, he was the guy who Inuyasha fought the end season two for the series. Mm hmm Yep. And he goes off to save his lover, his second one, mind you. Yeah, the first one I drew slightly in the series. I will, I will get to her when, when, when I get a chance to talk about final act. Yep, goes off to see Inuyasha's smoking hot mom. Yep. And he, she is, now there's this guy named Tojiro, I think his name is. I will I look up the guy's name here because he's kind of the secondary tag in this movie. Because he's here for the beginning of the movie. Let's see if I can find him here. Tekimaru. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tekimaru, who is kind of the villain of this opening sequence. He just basically goes after the woman he loves, who actually went off with the great dog demon in general kills a midwife because apparently no man is allowed to be in the birthing room. Yeah, from information I've read, this kind of is true from this time period. Yeah, that that part is completely true. That is not made up for the movie. That part was completely true. Mm hmm. I like nowadays, basically, guys can be in the birthing room if they wanted to. Yeah, it's basically their standards. So, goes to see her and. It's like, oh yeah, I'm here, and then he just stabs her. And I in a way, like like of the any watch as far as shows up, and he see, and he basically has to take out a bunch of soldiers under Tokushi's command. Takes on Tokushi briefly, chops off his arm, marches right through, sees her. Revives her with a Tensega, that's the healing sword, and you see him be perfectly fully, fully revived, and sees his child for the first time, and then of course the place has been set ablaze by Tokushi, and he and Tokushi have their basically their final battle in this place. Yep, and he also tells his wife, his name is, is he names he names his son Inuasha. Yeah, this is a bit of expansion basically. Or establish in flashback. Though here's kind of the strange thing about this. In here in this movie, this happens while the place is being burned down. In the anime, in the main series, this happened during when it was snowing. Though yeah, he was off to kill somebody, but I don't think it was this particular guy. He dies, and the demon general himself does show up one more time in the movie, but that's the last you see of him. This is also the first time you see the man's face for the first time, and he cut. He, he I mean. It looks like, though, some of his face, basically, you see him on Inuyasha because he looks a, looks a little bit like him. And it's pointed out that by Tokushi when he sees Inuyasha, he looks a lot like his mother, which is indeed true. Mm-hmm. Yep. Then we jump ahead to see the future, where Kagome is, like, basically kind of giving a recap of this, like, basically narrating from the series, the premise of the series, which he travels through time, battles demons, stuff like that. No mention of Raku, mind you. Yes, that's kind of the strange thing about these movies. That with the exception of the second film, these movies never mention the Raku. Never once do they ever mention him. Which I'm like, really? 
you don't mention the main villain of the series in your movies. Yeah, he's not going to show up in your movies. He show up in second, mind you. But he's not going to show up here, but you can at least reference him. Nope. <laughs> don't bother to reference him at all. And then we have Gilman and Stanley clean out their, basically, their shed of, basically, sacred family objects, basically a bunch of junk. And they come across an ancient sword, which has a strange symbol, and basically that the, there's a guy supposed to keep an eye, I think his name is Sokoki, I think his name is. And the sword basically acts a bit strange, gets out of the, not out of the sheath per se, but it does venture together, she, and he watch picks up, and apparently it also basically creates these strange, like, purple tubes that basically wrap around this whole freaking arm and goes inside of his skin, basically. I mean, the way the effect looks, it looks very similar to some other stuff I've seen in some of our, some of our series. Like, there was an episode of Outer Limits where every time that, that the main character of an episode fired off a gun, that was an alien space gun, it probably was nearly having the gun basically merge with his hand. Yeah, not the first time I've seen this in the basically in fiction, but yeah, it only lasts about the first, like, it lasts about, tw about unless it basically it gets off in Iwasha basically about 30 minutes into the movie. Yeah, and he goes back into the bonier as well. Of course, Gomi follows him, brings the sheath with him, with her. Yeah, the sheath itself actually stays with her the whole movie, and she never gets rid of it. Nope. Oh, in case you're wondering, I'll get to basically its fate by the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. This movie pretty much has, like, almost all the main supporting characters in the movie. It's like the only supporting characters not in the movie is Kaede and Kikyo. These two are the only, only ones not here, but pretty much. Everybody else is here. I mean, you have Shishimaru, Ren, Jaken, of course, the main Iwasha gang, and Tokushi. Yeah, they're all here. Even Miyoka is here. Okay, you have all these supporting characters, and they get a good amount to do, but I'm like, you don't have Kiko's movie? Kiko's not even mentioned this whole movie. Yeah, the only movie she's not making a physical appearance in the last film, it was a cameo. This film, it's pretty much just no mention of her, no appearance by her, nothing. And, yeah, any wash used the giant drag twister when he gets to the past, takes out a town, that, well, basically takes a whole village, but what kind of basically be able to evacuate the village just before it was destroyed, and creates a humongous, like, canyon in, in, the, in this area. Where in Japan this is, I have no idea. Then pretty much, and he watched basically like he be, and the sword basically stops possessing him. But and he, when he possesses him, first thing he goes to his demon mode, and eventually Shishu was able to catch up with them because he knows about the sword, and he fights any watcher for a good period of time. He fights over the course of this valley over the course of about ten minutes, and then eventually Gomei tells him to sit several times. Apparently the necklace basically breaks. And she also saves Ren and Jaken from Inuyasha as well, basically from the sword's wrath. So Shishimaru basically owes oh, so me a favor for this. By the way, never mention these movies are worth basically that these two that she that that Shishimaru owes Kagome a favor. So after she's after Inuyasha, she basically stops Inuyasha, and Shishimaru basically goes out for the sword, which decides to revive Tokushi. And then Tokushin, and then something very unusual happens. He goes to the area. The basically take take the sword takes Tokushin to. I believe this is supposed to be the dimension where the great demon general's body is buried, and apparently Shishimaru's arm is still there. I'm like, wouldn't they have right of the way by this point? And it still looks it still looks like it was, looks like it was freshly cut off. Yeah, what did this arm be gone by now? Now, in case you're wondering, in the series, does Sushu ever get this arm back? As far as I know, he doesn't. And this is also the first time that any Watcher's Father's corpse has appeared in the movies. It's appeared, like, a couple of episodes of season one. It's going to return to the current season I'm going to watch. But this is the only film appearance of the corpse, which is quite interesting. And no, no, no appearance inside of it. I mean, you see Shishimaru's arm there, kind of basically held together by vines, and gives it to Tokushin. And Tokushin takes a sword. And what's the first thing you do? Pretty 
pretty much give him Naraku's current look from the series at this point. With the whole spike shoulder pads. Yeah, it's a very similar look. I mean, appearance-wise, the guy looks almost exactly like Naraku. Also, he gets rid of his cool-looking helmet he had. And I should point out that the outfit he wears is basically the Shogun-style outfit that a lot of people... Uh, I've seen this outfit in pictures of basically Japanese-style Shogun attires. That's pretty much what the guy dressed like. He's dressed like a Japanese Shogun. And he dissed his cool helmet... Never wears it. Like he only wears it just in the opening scene, and then he when he comes back, like he doesn't buy it for the back. He gets a brand new sort of armor, and he's got a horn coming out of his head. And I'm sure anybody can point this out, though. This guy looks exactly like Naraku. It's just that same design, just different color scheme. Because Naraku is basically his spike thing is is gray, while this guy is just red. And what's the first thing he do after he gets his arm back? Give him a freaking castle. So he can have a so he can have a big battle scene with in the movie. So he goes to the castle, and apparently off screen kills everyone in the castle except for this one small army of about two thousand people who had just come back from winning a battle. Like, yeah, we're yeah, the, the guy who's in charge of this is like, hey, we're gonna drink all night long and have some stuff some a party because we want ourselves a freaking battle. They open the gates up and they see Tokushin or committed a massacre. They charge at him, and Tokushin kills him really easily, and then reanimates him as his frickin' soldiers. Yep. Though apparently he also, like, not long after, well, along with reviving these people as his own and their soldiers, he also remakes the entire frickin' castle into his own demonic appearance. Yeah, it looks very creepy. Yeah, very creepy. Though eventually Inuyasha and Shishimu basically chase everything, and they eventually do come to the era, and they have pretty much all the supporting characters, Tebo Kagome, and they all pretty much all, with the exception of Yoga, all take turn take on the army. But like there's like eight of us minus demons, and we got pretty much like 200 soldiers piece we could take on. Okay, perfectly fine. And they pretty much plow their way through. Eventually reunite with Kagome. With they see Inuasha, but then basically Shishimaru is separated from from his own sword, not Tokushin. It's the other one. It the one that given by his father. Ren goes after it just to be just be a good person, though she's not a fighter. She's basically just uh, someone follows on Shishimaru. Yeah, because she fell behind the kingship with him, and holds on to it. So look at the sword's very protect. Look at the sword can protect her. Though because Goi was happily there, the one of the undead demons. Yeah, they show this particular demon early on, when apparently Inuasha killed him with when he was possessed by the sword. They came back as very much undead zombies. Though apparently it takes. Believe it or not, Kagome's arrows to basically destroy these damn things. And also, Moroku's wind tunnel. Apparently, these things also have poison in it, which also poisons him as well. Yeah. And after going through all these soldiers, eventually finally gets the freaking castle. takes a long time. It's like, and he watches, like, Shishiro, what are you doing here? It's like, yeah, they're both surprised to each other. Despite the fact they had just saw each other, like, barely a day before. Yeah. And he plowed through the castle, and of course, Tanosuke basically sees Kagome and Ren. By the way, Ren and Kagome actually refer to her by name, which is something they bear. I should point out, though, in the actual series itself, these two have not had an, barely interaction from the point I've watched in the series. I mean, they've seen each other, but they never actually really kind of talked to each other. I mean, Kagome interacted with Jack a lot in the series, not much Ren. And I kind of pointed out to myself, basically, because watching like these two, like these two look almost exactly alike, and that's not due to the fact that because they're drawn by the same person. Yeah, this is pointed out though in series in a filler episode. Yeah, but it's never really acknowledged if Rin is related to Kagome at any point. Yeah, and eventually Shishimaru was the first one who breaks the lines to take on Tokushin. And Tokus is about taking off because they you know, both remind him of his of his late of, of, of basically his late crush. So he attempts to kill him. Lock up Shishimaru stops him with his own sword. And Rin basically is happy to see him, and she says, "Be gone, both of you." Like, and of course Rin just leaves the sword on the ground for him to pick up, and he basically is fine with that. So he contends basically fighting him. And he watches finally gets through. Well. First, basically, they have Rin. Rin apparently it's failed. Rin had basically 
this is of course prior to getting to the actual place, Rain had basically taken the time as a favor for saving her life to get up all the bees basically of the of the of the Nicholas's subjugation. The one in Washington wearing the series. Yeah, it broke and he doesn't wear it for the rest of the movie. He does put it back on. I will tell I will tell you soon basically when he puts it back on. And then of course they go they try to go down the stairs and then the, one of the demons pop up basically the demon that kidnapped him and then he watch comes up slices the thing in half. He watch they begin to cast things of course to the supporting characters taking on the rest of the army. Of course Morocco uses Winton to pretty much absorb all these soldiers. He's out this for a freaking long time and his arms pretty much turned to red. Yeah, he eventually does heal, so don't worry, he'd be perfectly fine. He does tell Song of, like, I never let anything happen to the woman I love. That's what he tells her. And despite the fact at one point in the movie, he does do this usual thing of rubbing her butt. Because he's a pervert. And he's revealed though his father apparently was also a pervert as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah, something that was never mentioned in the series at all, if his father ever was a pervert. I'm sure his grandfather probably was. His father never mentioned. Aside from the fact he had the Winto, nothing much is mentioned about Moroku's father at all. Aside from the fact he had the Winto, and the Winto consumed him. Yeah, but him being a pervert, that's something new. And then, of course, Iwasha and Susumu basically battle alongside, basically, they battle the guy. For a while, and then eventually he's knocking on the wall, and he's able to die peacefully because he figured out, though, yeah, that he realized that the woman that he loved never did, did abandon him, just protecting him. And then he slowly dies. So Shimmer uses his own sword to basically take him out. And apparently, he also wanted a sword because apparently a sword can actually sort of, well, kill him. It basically destroy his own, destroy the sword itself. And then it's like, okay, it's not over yet. So the sword basically. With which is in Sushimaru's arm, left arm's hand, and forms his own separate body, and opens up the gates of hell. Yeah, and in the protective body, basically all the supporting characters are put inside of a sheath barrier. Yeah, all the supporting characters, every last one of them, and Sushimaru and Iwash basically spend the last part of the movie basically battling him, battling the sword, and eventually thanks to Kagome. They're able to combine both their attacks because, well, apparently Shimmer has somebody to protect, and they're able to destroy the sword. Well, destroy the body, and of course the sword falls into the, falls into hell, and it's sealed. Bam, done. And of course Shimmer and his scoop go off, and then we have the cre and of course everything's like kind of back to normal. But, but wait, what about those beads? Well, that's handled after the post. It's happened a post credit scene, and it lasted like one minute. Like I have something nice for you. Close your eyes. And she took time, put the beads back on, and first thing you want to do is put it back on. Like, let's kind of at least keep you on. Keep you, let's just say, for any way. And she tells him to sit, and that's the movie ends. This movie overall is actually pretty good. And it's an interesting note that all the supporting characters have something to do with this movie. It's a, and I like the fact, beyond the, not just the main characters of the series, but also... Shashamura's group, Tokichin gets a chance something to do, which is really nice. Just the character doesn't really physically appear in this series. As what happens to Sheath, it's never explained what happens to him. Yeah, the sword itself is basically in hell, but what about the Sheath that basically contained it for, for allegedly for 700 years? Nothing. Because the, the Sheath never appears outside of this movie. This movie overall is really good. It's got very good special effects. I love... The, the opening title sequence basically is beautiful animation. I freaking enjoyed it. It kind of felt as though that the way this movie was made, it seems this movie was made by two different studios because the way the second, the way when you get to like the other side of the movie, it seems like this movie is made by three different teams using three different animation styles. Like the beginning movie is kind of like from a different series I didn't recognize. The the male portion kind of looks similar to. The style of it looks similar to what they used in the main series, and a third one from a completely different studio. That didn't look terrible, per se. Um, they used a bit of CGI in the movie, which I thought that was interesting. Of course, this was 2003, mind you. It looked okay. It wasn't terrible. And the camera was so good in this movie. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, 
it still kind of holds up the whole period. The movie itself is like roughly 16... Well, it released over 16 years ago in Japan. Here was released roughly 14 years ago. Yeah, four, almost 14 years. Yep, but not much I'll say with this movie, except, except it's really, really good. Okay, so that's it for this particular review. Tomorrow, expect just roughly one video tomorrow, maybe two. One video definitely hoping to come in tomorrow will be a review for the next eight episodes of Inuasha. Okay, see you next video. Bye.